Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. What's your brand core? Mother, mechanic, or missionary? Hello everyone, I'm Kevin Cruz. Welcome to the Lead X Show, helping you to get just a little bit better every single day. And I hope you'll tell your friends on Facebook that. I hope you'll tell all your colleagues at work, walk into work, go into the conference room on the whiteboard, just scrawl. The Lead X podcast is the smartest way to start your day. It'll be like graffiti. It's like marketing street style. And check out leadx.org. Once you put down that, that marker and you've been graffitiing your office, <laughs> go to leadx.org, where, of course, we're offering a new free course every single day. Nobody's doing that but us. We've had leadership experts teaching courses on authentic leadership, on how to delegate effectively, how to give effective feedback. I personally taught a course on employee engagement, and I taught my... I would say famous, all right, maybe infamous, but I go with famous course on how do I maximize my energy, attention, and focus for extreme productivity. Now today, it's a lot of fun. I talked to a marketing guru who actually worked with Steve Jobs on the launch of the original Macintosh. We talk about what was it like to work with Steve Jobs? How to identify your core? What type of personal brand core do you have? Mothers, mechanics, missionaries are the three. And what does she think of Tim Cook and Apple's marketing today? But first, I've got your tip. Beware of reverse delegation. Are your employees delegating back to you? The traditional open door policy is broken. A lot of employees, about half of them actually, will never go through that open door. The other half often come through far too often. They become overly dependent on company leaders. Legendary leadership guru, Marshall Goldsmith, explored the reason for this in an essay he wrote several years ago for Harvard Business Review. It was, uh, the year was 2010. He points out that employees know their jobs better than anyone else in the organization, but not everyone's comfortable with making decisions, with taking risks. Goldsmith wrote, it isn't possible for a leader to empower someone to be accountable and to make good decisions. People have to empower themselves. Your role is to encourage and support the decision-making environment and to give employees the tools and knowledge they need to make and act upon their own decisions. By doing this, you help your employees reach an empowered state. End Marshall Goldsmith. So oftentimes an open door policy is sort of a lazy substitute as a manager for taking the time and effort and energy to train and to coach our team members so that they can make good decisions without coming through the open door. I have to keep reminding myself, yes, it is easier to just answer their question right now. It is easier for me to just make the decision and send them on their way. But then next week, got a minute, they'll be back. And I'm gonna have to do it all over again. So beware of reverse delegation. On today's episode, our guest is the founder of Cunningham Collective, a marketing brand and communication strategy firm. She's played a role in the launch of many technology categories and products, including the Apple Macintosh. Her new book is Get to Aha, Discover Your Positioning DNA and Dominate Your Competition. Our guest is Andy Cunningham. Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. It's really great to be here. Great to have you on, and we're going to talk about your new book in just a minute, but we have a tradition where we ask all of our guests the same first question, which is, will you tell us a story about a time when you failed at something? Because we actually want to know what you learned from it. We want to learn along with you. <laughs> well, I think there's many to choose from, so I'll, <laughs> I'll pick... I'll pick one sort of bad decision that I made, which I think led to to a failure, and that is that uh, after I was done doing the agency business for quite some time, I made the decision to go in-house and become the chief marketing officer at a company, and I made a really bad decision about the company. It was a company that uh, the product wasn't what the uh, CEO said it was, mm. and the engineering wasn't what they said it was, so I went about trying to... Uh, 
you do my normal thing with positioning and marketing and get people all inspired about this. And in the end, it, it just the product was really bad and it was a very bad decision. And so, of course, everything that I did from a marketing perspective failed. So that's probably a whole collection of 10 or 12 or 20 failures <laughs> all in one big batch. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's well, I, I've always heard, you know, great marketing can't save a bad product, right? So true. So true. And that, and that's a judgment call, right? And, uh, you know, when you're making a decision about who to represent, whether you're an agency or if you're a person going to work for a company, you really need to make sure the product is what you think it is. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I know you've had, a, obviously, a, a very successful career agency side, and we hear also non-agency. I mean, what advice would you give to a young professional, you know, she wants to stand out and get ahead in her career? You know, I think if you're young, meaning if you're in your 20s still, so that's really young to me now, yeah. um, it, What the best thing to do is to try to work for some companies that other people have heard of, whether you're doing it on an agency front or whether you're doing it as, a, as an employee at a company, because when it won't be the job that you have forever. You're only going to probably do that job for a couple of years, and when you go to your next job, you're going to want the employer to say, I've heard of that company. They did great things because you will then be tied to the great things that that company did, whether or not you had anything to do with it. And for young people, that's super important. That's great career advice. And I know early in your own career, you actually worked on the launch of the Apple Macintosh. So what was that like? Yes, I was very lucky to have had uh, a very famous product to work for that turned out to be a successful product. So it was it was an amazing experience. And working with Steve Jobs was one of the most uh, inspiring challenging, but inspiring, <laughs> uh, life-changing experiences that I've ever had. He taught me so much about marketing and about leadership and about quality. It was a, it was an incredible experience. And we're very lucky that the Macintosh succeeded because the product they launched right before that, the Lisa, was a huge failure, which fortunately I did not have anything to do with. <laughs> right, right. Now, of course, um, from the books and the, the, the media, I think the, the general population, when we think of Steve Jobs, obviously – brilliant innovator. Uh, we think he challenges people. And we also think he's hard to work for. He might not be the nicest guy. Is that about right? Or, or do we have something wrong about sort of the, the popular vision of Steve Jobs? Well, I'd like to say two, two things about that. The first thing is when, when I was working with Steve Jobs, which was in the 80s when, when the Macintosh was launched, he was not yet an experienced CEO or even really an experienced executive. He was a young guy brash with huge vision and uh, passion to change the world. But his leadership skills were really lacking. He was not very good at, at managing people or leading people. What happened later on after he got kicked out of Apple and then went and formed Next and had that experience, which ended up as a failure, he then came back to Apple a much wiser and much better leader. And so the people who worked with him after he came back to Apple, have a very different perspective of Steve than those of us who worked with him in the early 80s. And it and it's a far, I think, nicer view of him as a leader than he was when I worked with him early on. Yeah, it, it's a good point, you know, to remember, uh, not just with, with Steve Jobs, but with any of these high profile leaders. I mean, I, I was a horrible boss when I was in my 20s, and I'm 50 <laughs> now, and hopefully I'm a better boss. I won't say I'm a perfect boss. But you know, <laughs> we all mature and change over the decades of our career, right? There's not just yes. one version of us. Right. And he got so much better at leadership and management that, that I, I really, I envy the people who had the opportunity to work with him later because he was not only the great visionary and great marketing leader that he, or marketing expert that he was early on, but he was also a much better leader. So, and the second thing I did want to say one other thing about Steve, Yeah, his agenda in life was always very pure. It was really to change the world. He wasn't about power. He wasn't about money and he wasn't about women, which many, many of these CEOs are. And that made working for him, even during his most difficult days, the most refreshing experience, you know, that you could possibly ever have and also inspiring because he was just so pure about his agenda. Yeah, I like that word inspiring. Like it must have been infectious just to be around him knowing that he was, I mean, trying to put a dent in the universe. Absolutely. And and you knew that he was doing that. You knew he was putting a dent in the universe. And he, if you were working with him, it's because he thought you could help. And that was just an honor to be even be in that position. Now, Andy, your, your new book is Get to AHA, Discover Your Positioning DNA and Dominate Your Competition. So give us what's the, the big idea behind the book? 
So the book is, it's a marketing book about a concept that uh, was invented in the 70s called positioning. And positioning is the art and science of, of owning real estate in the mind of the potential customer. And uh, in a book was written in the 70s called Positioning by Jack Trout and Al Reese. And they did this book prior to the internet. And so life in, in that era was very different and doing positioning and doing marketing was very different. Uh, so my book is what I kind of affectionately call Positioning 2.0, and it takes into consideration all that has occurred between the 70s and now on the concept of positioning and marketing. So that's the big idea. And for the Leadex family out there, the the original uh, book Positioning, um, it really is a marketing classic. So for anyone who, who's at all interested in, I think it goes from personal branding to if you have a company or, or want to understand the position of companies, it's a great uh, classic to read. And yep. your book, I, which I also love, and I love the way you've you've <laughs> positioned it to me as as sort of an updated version, you know, post post internet. And you talk about like you, you almost simplify. You say there's three types of companies. You know, mothers, mechanics, missionaries. Tell me more about that. Sure. So I treat companies like people because they are comprised of people. So I think they have DNA just like people have DNA, and uh, DNA informs who you are, and uh, and what you what your potential is. And I feel companies are the same way. And I've I've done hundreds and hundreds of these types of engagements with companies, and came to the conclusion after doing about a thousand of them that. There are really only three kinds of companies in the world. There are customer-oriented companies, which I affectionately call mothers. There are product-oriented companies, which I affectionately call mechanics. And there are concept-oriented companies, which I call missionaries. And uh, within those three companies, your company will fall into one of those three categories. And the reason you know this is because it's not just a label. It's actually how you manage the company, how you structure the company, how you hire people, how you fire people, how you measure success. Each one of those companies does it in a slightly different way. The uh, mothers do it based on customers and customer relationships. The mechanics do it based on product. And the missionaries do it based on concept or next big thing. So g- give me some examples from companies that we might have heard of, like examples from each of these categories. Sure. So I think some a good example of some mother companies, Lyft is a wonderful example, uh, and you can kind of just feel it when you see their marketing materials or get in one of their cars. Nordstrom is another great example of a mother of a mother company. Um, on the uh, mechanic side, Oracle and Microsoft, typical great examples of companies that are really focused on product and uh, and building a great product around features and and all the great things that you can do with product. And the missionaries. You know, FedEx is a great example. They exist, FedEx, Apple, Tesla. These companies exist to fundamentally change human behavior at some level. And when they succeed, uh, that's when I I give them the moniker of being a missionary. And that's what Steve Jobs was, and that's what Apple was when I worked with them. It's interesting to me that, and I understand you'd say missionary companies might be like Apple or Tesla. And I think people who are fans of Apple and Tesla would say, but they're, they've got the superior product. So just because you've got... Just because you're product obsessed doesn't necessarily make you a mechanic as a company, right? Right. And and by the way, they they appear to be product obsessed, but they're not always. When we launched the Macintosh, it didn't have cursor keys, couldn't print anything, didn't have a network. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it wasn't really product obsessed. I mean, yes, it was a beautiful piece of furniture to put on your desk and it, it worked in a different way. It had a graphical user interface, but it was not what I would call a, a, a product obsessed company at that stage of the game. So um, it really what Steve was trying to do was change behavior, change computing behavior. He wanted to he wanted people to feel about their computer like you would about an affectionate uh, friendship that you might have. He wanted you to have a relationship with your computer. He wanted to change how you would actually interact with your computer. And he did that in part through the product, through the u- graphical user interface and the size and all that. But he also did it with you know many, many other other mechanisms that he that he put to use. Wow, that's interesting. and and is that was that unique to to Apple at the time, or would you say that, I don't know, Elon Musk wants us to change our relationship with our automobiles? Well, I think Elon Musk has a different approach to it. And if you read anything that anytime Elon Musk says anything and he makes it into the news, it's not about cars. It's hardly ever about cars. What it's about, it's about changing the way people transport themselves from one place to another. Mm. So he spends all of his time in what I would call the thought leadership realm about the future of transportation. 
And that's how he does it. Now, Steve did it more or less about how he was going to change the way people relate to their computers. But Elon Musk does it around talking about how we're going to change how we move ourselves from one place to another, whether it's Earth to Mars or whether it's just simply from here to Los Angeles. I'm I'm taking copious notes, Andy, because you're you're giving me ideas about things I need to change about the way I talk about lead to to come back to this and to think harder uh, about it. So we, let's say we've identified that our you know our company is a, a missionary company, etc. Et you also talk in your book about then the positioning part, which you you give the six C's, and you know in a short format show we can't go deep into the six C's, but tell us a little bit more about then the positioning. Sure. So there are these six C's and I'll just quickly say what they are. The first one is core and that's your DNA. So you need to understand, are you a mother or a mechanic or a missionary? Then there is a community, which is the customers you're selling to and the people who influence that community. So you have to understand them. Then there is competition. Of course, you have to understand how your competition is uh, positioning themselves. There is also uh, context, which is what is going on in the world around you in order to understand what's happening uh, so that you don't position yourself as something that's outdated or no longer important. Criteria is another C, which is uh, figuring out exactly what you want that statement to say about yourself so that when you come up with your positioning statement in the end, you you get it right. So you want to understand, I have these five things I want it to incorporate. And finally, category. Uh, category is an important question these days, especially in the tech industry. Are you building a new category? Are you augmenting another, an old category? Are you going to be adding to a category that already exists? So those are all the questions that you really need to fully examine before you come up with your positioning statement in the end. That makes a lot of sense. Now, in the past, I wrote years, uh, years ago about this where like my, I kind of leaped exponentially. My third company was exponentially better than my second company when I started to put the word only into my positioning statement. You know, I wanted to be the only one. Now, is this a good practice? Like, is that a, a sign of doing positioning right? You're the only one that does what you do? Or is that like, well, no, you don't have to be that extreme about identifying your position. I think if you if you have an onlyness statement, and by the way, I think that's one of Simon Sinek's uh, tenets of of good marketing is what is your onlyness statement? What do you do only that other people don't do? So it's important to understand what that is. Um, but not every company has an onlyness, at least in the product from a product perspective. Sometimes the onlyness has to do with other things like the customer set that you're going after, or the the features that you offer on that product or the value that you deliver in the end. So I think there are many ways to attack the positioning, but if you have an onlyness statement, you should use it. <laughs> That's great. And, and you also uh, talk about in your book, which I, I'm a big believer in the power of storytelling and the hero's journey. I like Joseph Campbell stuff. And you talk about brand archetypes. What do you mean by that? <laughs> So uh, Carl Jung, uh, many, many years ago, came up with this uh, map that he created called that he called personality archetypes. And I believe there are 12 in his map. And marketing people have been stealing from Carl Jung for many, <laughs> many years on this topic. And we are no different. We have. So he's got these 12 archetypes of human personalities. And again, because I treat companies like people, I, I ascribe the people archetypes to companies. So we have hero, as you mentioned, we also have mavericks, we have jester, we have uh, the common man. So there's there's a number of them. And, and companies, interestingly enough, do reflect those archetypes just like human beings do. And once you understand what that is, you can put voice to those personalities, just as you would a person, and make the brand come alive much more uh, realistically once you've got, you know, color and personality and voice and tone of voice added to what that archetype is. So when it comes to brand personality, I mean, is this something that you kind of look around and uncover or, you know, everybody in the C-suite says, you know what, we're going to be the every man. Like, do you pick it or is it just who you are? <laughs> That's that's a great question. I think I think much of it is who you are, but at some point or other you do have to you do have to come together as a management team and decide what you're going forward with. And the problem that most companies have today is they don't do that. You've got one person who thinks it's one personality, one who thinks it's another, another one who thinks it's something else, and what you end up with is a mishmash. So uh, an important thing for marketing people to do is to make sure that the entire C-suite is aligned on what is the what is the positioning statement, 
What is the brand archetype? What is the brand personality? So that all the marketing that you do putting for putting forth into the market is authentic. First of all, it has to reflect who you are as a company, your DNA, but then also is aligned with each other, with, with all the other stuff that you do. Because you can't have your recruiting materials saying one thing and your marketing brochure saying something else and your website saying something else yet again. That makes sense. Now, for you mentioned again the companies uh, in terms of the position position you treat it like people. They're made up of people. Now, for the people in my audience who are you know solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, they're in, or even you know working on improving their own career, maybe in a in a big company. How can they take, or what's a good starting point for taking your work? And applying it to personal branding, you know, if I'm going to think about this for my personal brand, what do I do today to start to get at it? Well, I think the first thing is, is just what I would tell a company, which is understand whether you are a product oriented person, a customer oriented person or a concept oriented person, and then put yourself in a situation with a company that is aligned with that particular type of DNA. Because if you are a product person and you really care about nothing more than product and you go work for a company that is trying to build incredible relationships with customers, it's going to be a little bit of an issue. You might find a great role in the engineering department if you happen to be an engineer, but if you're not an engineer, it it could create a, a misalignment between your objectives with your career and the objectives of the company. So I'm, I'm all for aligning who you are as a person with the type of company you choose to work for. Wow, that's a uh, great and unique advice. Uh, Leadex listeners, you know, I always like to challenge you to get 1% better every single day. So our challenge of, of the day is going to be to pause and think about your core. You know, are you a mother, a mechanic, missionary? And then what's the core of the company you're in now? And are, are you aligned or are you misaligned? Maybe need to make an adjustment. Exactly. Andy, final question before I let you go. You know, uh, you, you spoke about the early days of, of launching the Macintosh. So I, I just can't help but ask, I mean, what are you thinking of some of the, uh, the, the advertisements and the branding that you're seeing coming out of Apple today? I want to say this about Tim Cook. He, he has been the most amazing steward of the assets that he was left. He has taken something of one size and grown it and expanded it and made the brand bigger and made it more valuable and all of those things. But what he hasn't done is he hasn't been a missionary about bringing the next big thing to market. So I I love the branding they do. They still do a wonderful job. I love the ad campaigns, but the products have not exhibited next big thingness to me since Steve died, unfortunately. And I keep wondering, like, are they just going to out of the blue announce that they have like a whole self-driving car network that we didn't know about? <laughs> because it seems like <laughs> maybe there's something in, you know, there, there, that's a deep, deep secret that they're going to spring on us. And yet every year goes by and we're not hearing it yet. <laughs> well, Apple is the best company at keeping secrets. So I won't say that that's <laughs> not possible, but I, uh, I think that we would have seen at least one next big thing in the last several years, which which unfortunately we haven't. We've seen lots of improvements, lots of features added. So Apple is a company that's moving, I believe, from being a missionary to being a mechanic. They are mm. becoming now much more about the product and the features and and all of that than they used to be. That's interesting. So Andy, how can our listeners find out more about you, your company, and of course your new book? Well, I would love for them to uh, to get the book. So you can get the book at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. It's called Get to Aha, as you pointed out. And uh, you can also go to my website, which is gettoaha.com. But it's G-E-T, the number two, A-H-A dot com. Um, and also I'm Andy Cunningham 4 on Twitter. Wonderful. And we will put all of these links in the show notes and our social media campaigns as well. Andy, thanks for coming on to the LeadX show. Thank you, Kevin. It was great to be here. Friends, before we go, remember, at LeadX, we're on a mission to give free leadership training and professional development to everyone, anywhere, at any time. Visit leadx.org.org, that is, to check out our course of the day. Or visit leadx.org forward slash Branson to download our free ebook, Richard Branson's Seven Secrets to Leadership. And please take one quick minute, go to leadx.org forward slash subscribe to subscribe and leave a rating for this podcast, The LeadX Leadership Show, leadx.org forward slash subscribe. Until next time, remember, you have incredible influence on those around you, your family, your team at work, your community. We all need you to lead mindfully. How will you lead today?